Welcome, everybody. My name is Torvald Grongmo. I'm going to moderate this uh, uh, panel um, on what is modern money. Um, we're going to start with first principles. So it's early in the morning, and so we'll ask some easy question. What's money, and where does it come from? Um, and um, we have uh, a distinguished panel. Uh, first out is Ron Gray. He is a doctoral candidate in law at Cornell Law School. And he is also uh, the founder of Modern Money Network. Um, and I encourage you to look up the, the network website, which um, is called modernmoneynetwork.org. You can make a note of that. After him, we have Jesper Jespersen, who is professor at Brushilde University. And um, he has been there for many years and has written a lot of books. Uh, one interesting book I find um, is the macroeconomic methodology, uh, a post case in perspective, which uh, I think also was your doctoral thesis a long time ago, uh, where I found a quote which I wanted to, uh, to just share with you. Economics is a science of thinking in terms of models, joined to the art of finding models which are relevant to the contemporary world. A quote from Keynes, I believe. Okay, and then finally we have Erling Stegem, who is known in Norway to everybody. He is a professor at BI, and before then for many, many years, professor at the Bergen Business School. Um, and he will comment um, after the two have finished their presentation. Uh, you have up to 30 minutes, uh, not more, and then Erling will go on after that, and then we have questions at the end. So, Rowan, uh, the floor is yours. And please make sure to use the mic there oh, or here. yeah you can use this one sure. uh, I'll, I'll use that one okay. great uh, no presentation so uh, well good morning everyone what an absolute pleasure to be here um, and thank you to Eber and the other organizers for putting on such a, a great conference and for giving me the opportunity to finally come to a country I've wanted to visit for so long um, I run the modern money network uh, as Thor just said uh, so hopefully I can give you some idea about what we mean by the term modern money and why modern money theory exists. Um, that term was sort of given to the, the name, uh, the, the group of scholars that we work with, the economists uh, who put these ideas together, many of which many other economists have uh, thought about, engaged with, or even adopted to some degree. But the, the package of ideas and the way that they're all put together is what we understand modern money theory to be. Um, the word modern money is actually also a quote uh, from Keynes in his treatise on money where he says that uh, the state comes first as the authority of law that enforces contracts, but not only enforces contracts, enforces what things can be used to pay contracts. And that has been true of all modern states for the last 4,000 years. So by the word modern, we're not meaning that the 20th century, I'll leave my other colleague to speak about contemporary policy issues in more detail, but by the word modern there, we're talking about large advanced societies that have complicated governance institutions beyond face-to-face -face contact. So there could be different monies that existed in smaller hunter-gatherer societies or that exist in other forms of social organization throughout history. This isn't some general theory of all money everywhere. It's a theory of a particular kind of money that happens to be the one that's been most relevant to contemporary uh, politics and society for maybe the last 4,000 years. Um, so I'll start a little bit back there and explain why we think these ideas are relevant to the way that we think about money today. So the first starting point, I would say, is that we start with something that isn't money. We start with the idea of debts, of relationships that we owe each other. And not debts that we would think about like the debt that we owe to a bank, but the idea of a debt like, I owe you one, like a favor, or like some sort of obligation. And for a lot of human history, those kinds of debts existed between people who either knew each other or who existed in a community where people knew each other. And so in that space, you don't need to have the same kind of precision or the same kind of objectivity about what the debt is. If I do my sister a favor, I don't need to keep exact track of what that favor is because we're in an ongoing relationship over time that we will do each other favors and over time we can get an idea of whether we are being fair to each other. 
What you see at that critical moment when we start to move into larger forms of social organization is that those kinds of relationships start to become insufficient to keep society together. So you start to see situations where people from different tribes or clans or families have fights with each other that need to be settled at that moment in time because otherwise those groups might end up going to war or fighting each other or that might not get resolved in a way that is going to keep that community together until they come back around again, maybe for the next big festival or the next big group um, religious ceremony. And so what, is it, what emerges in those communities is ways to resolve disputes. If you think about the classic biblical story, you know, Solomon is sitting there and two people come with a baby, or if you look at in the Old Testament, all the different numbers that they have for how much you have to pay if you steal someone's goat, or if you covet somebody's spouse or something. All of these different numbers in that place are a way of having an authority work out how to resolve disputes between people without bloodshed and without war. So we start from that point of view, and in that place we can think of the government as being a religious authority, a shaman, a church, not just the kind of modern, secular, Westphalian, democratic, governmental state that we think of today, but any form of authority that exists to keep a community together. So the question of what happens when we take that personal relationship, give it a number, and then turn that number into something that we can compare to other people's numbers. So if I did you a favor, now I can say I did you precisely three units worth of a favor, which means that if you do somebody else precisely three units of a favor, maybe those things can cancel each other out. Maybe that person now owes me. In the past, I can't tell my sister to tell somebody else that they have to pay me back or that I have to pay them back. It was a relationship with that person, but now it becomes a relationship to the instrument, to the debt itself. And that is the critical moment where we start to move from interpersonal, informal relations to formal debt relations. And once we're there, then we start to get into the conversation about modern money. And what we would start from is the idea that whoever is in the place of responsibility to work out what those prices are is in the position to set up the currency system. What I mean by that is if somebody comes to you and says, I've done something bad or that person has done something bad to me, if you're in the position where you can say, okay, stealing a cow is three times as bad as stealing a chicken or killing their eldest child is three times as bad as killing their youngest child, then you're in a position to start creating a relationship of value between different activities. What we then see today, fast forward, is that becomes the unit of account. We don't think of money as something where the way that we count it is political because most of us don't think of numbers that way. One, two, three, four. It just follows logically. But the idea that a car is worth 5,000 times how much you paid for breakfast, that relationship doesn't follow logically like counting from one to 10. That relationship is only because the way that we've set up the economy and the price system puts those things into relationship with each other. So if you think about how much time and energy you put into making sure that you don't pay a dollar extra for a bottle of milk, and then you think about how much time and energy you put into making sure that you didn't get cheated out of $1,000 on your car, we don't put a 1,000 times as much energy into that latter one. We think of them as different places or different experiences, even if they use the same numbers underneath. And who comes up with that number system is where we start our story of who is in charge of creating money. So in this context, we could talk about kings and priests, but throughout history, there have been different entities that compete for that authority. In certain times in Europe, 
there were multiple overlapping governance authorities trying to claim that they were the most important or that their authority was the final authority on a particular issue. Nowadays, the sort of modern state does that role, but in the past, we didn't have the same kind of uh, consistency which enabled us to see how these things interacted more clearly. Once we get to that idea, we can think of the fact that there's a difference between the number system and the actual things, the units that get filled into that number system. So anyone in this room can create an IOU in euros. You don't need to be the ECB to do that. There is a difference between the ECB being able to set up the euro as a unit of account and any person in this room being able to create an instrument denominated in euros which could circulate in some form of money or financial instrument. So from my point of view as a lawyer, we can think of that as a debt, but we can also think of the word debt there quite expansively. So we have taxes, which is a very obvious example where there's an authority that puts an obligation on you that you have to pay. But we can also think of things like a fee or a fine or a parking ticket or even the idea of getting insurance because you're worried that maybe one day you, some will do, will do something on your land or hit your car and then you'll have to pay money at that point. So the risk of having to pay money can also even be a form of tax that gives you a need to earn that currency. So where we start from to use a slogan is taxes drive the value of a currency. And what we mean by that is anybody in this room may or may not find Bitcoin or Ripple or Ethereum an interesting idea but you don't have a choice to use the national currency to pay your taxes because that's not something that you have the discretion, that's something the authority has the discretion over. So when you are forced to use a certain currency for part of your life, that currency is going to have a value that it otherwise wouldn't. And our looking at history, our claim is that throughout most of history, when you have a stable government, or authority that can impose a tax like that, their unit of account, their instrument, their money becomes the most money in that space. We could all issue money in this room, but chances are most of us are still going to want to earn chrono euro or something at the end of the day. So anyone can create money. The challenge is to get it accepted. And when it comes to state money, the state has a set of tools to ensure um, that its money will be accepted that the rest of us don't have. If you're in the mafia, maybe you can put a gun to people's head and make them earn your mafia dollars or something. But most of us aren't going to go there, at least so explicitly, anytime soon. When we think about that, we immediately get to a point where money itself is not just a piece of metal. It's not just the most easy technology to do something that we could have done without money. Because I can trade you cows and chickens, but without a unit of account, I don't know how that matches to the car market or anything else, or the housing market or something. So the unit of account is so much bigger than any individual trade or any individual relationship that we can't say that money is just barter done better or barter done with some more advanced technology and maybe a nice mobile phone app. Instead, money has to be something that is a whole system that individual money units exist inside of. And so when we look at from that point of view, the idea that we can define money solely in terms of what a particular monetary instrument is doing, in terms of being a medium of exchange or a means of settlement or a store of value, all of those words that you might have heard in your undergraduate econ 101 class, if we define money only functionally, we kind of miss the point. We kind of miss the forest for the trees. And when we think about what the purpose of money is, we go so far beyond the idea that money is just a way for you and I to get along. Because if there's a story about you and I getting along, 
there's no authority. There's no state. There's no one who's creating the unit of account. That's where we need to start our story. And so if we think of taxes driving money, another way that we can think of that is when the government creates money, why is it trying to do that? If I already have all of the Rowan dollars that ever existed, why am I trying to get it back from you in taxes? I don't need to give you the Rowan dollars and get them back again so that I can spend them. I already had an infinity sign next to the amount of Rowan dollars I had. I never needed to tax from you to get those Rowan dollars. But what I did need to do was to force you to need Rowan dollars. So a colleague of mine, Warren Moser, likes to joke, right now, nobody in this room is in, is in the Rowan economy. But if I stood at the door with a gun and said, nobody can leave until you pay me 10 Rowan dollars, suddenly you're all unemployed. You all really need to earn those Rowan dollars, otherwise you're going to have a really miserable weekend. So it's a kind of violent, almost aggressive way of thinking about money. <laughs> it's certainly different from the idea that we're all just here because we, we like to cooperate or we're just mutually convenient needs that happen to meet. Money isn't coming from a place of purely horizontal, egalitarian meeting of the mind. Money is coming from a place of politics and hierarchy and power relations. That's where we have to start thinking about what the role of money and what the role of taxes is. And in the context of the state, it's pretty clear that the purpose of taxing there is not to earn the money, it's to earn the real stuff. So if you're a warlord, again, I'm going to keep it violent just for the sake of clarity. If you're a warlord, one thing that you need is an army. <laughs> It's pretty hard to raid people's villages if you don't have ships and warriors. So what you need to do is have some way of forcing a group of people or encouraging a group of people to want to be your army. One way a warlord will do that is say to them, when we take over these villages, we're going to tax the village. That's the price they pay for losing a war. And we're going to give you all the money to pay them. So if you want to get food, if you want to go to the bar, if you want to take some of their pottery or any other thing of theirs that you might want to take, they're going to have to give it to you because otherwise you're going to burn down their village again. So what the purpose of the taxation system there is, is to take people's labor, to take their goods and services and to move some of it into the public sector. To take it out of that violent space for a second today, that's how we have public schools. And that's how we have roads. And that's how we have a court system. It's because people get up every day and they give their labor and their intellect and the stuff in their homes to the government in exchange for money. And part of why they need that money is to then pay the government back. Not because the government needed the money. They had the money in the first place. But because the government wanted you to do work for them. Once we've set up that circuit, that nice internal circuit, where the public sector is provisioning itself, there may be entities that decide to trade with each other using that currency. So if I, got, if I get taxed every year $100, but I happen to earn $500, I could give that $400 to other people who could clean my house or pick up my kids from school or something. And so I could create a private sector around that public sector relationship. But again, the value still is driven by that underlying tax value. So one insight that comes from this point of view, again, to sort of bring it down to a slogan, is that unemployment is a monetary phenomenon. What I mean by that is there is no fish in the ocean that wakes up every day worried that it's unemployed. Slaves have a lot of problems, but one thing they don't have a problem is that they want to do more work than they have available to them. There are a whole range of different kinds of economies that we can set up, but unemployment, defined as people wanting to earn money and not being able to get it, is a uniquely monetary phenomenon. So who's responsible for creating the monetary system might be a good starting point to work out who is responsible for unemployment itself. The second thing to think about is who is responsible for creating money? 
Because today, obviously, there's a central bank. There's the government that creates other forms of coins and government debt, which we're going to hear more about in the later talks. But there's also other entities that the government licenses. You know, if you think of those American Westerns where there's the sheriff and then he has a bunch of deputies, the, the government puts a deputy badge on a whole range of financial institutions, most notably banks. And they go out and engage in activities that resemble money creation as deputies of the government. Their position exists only because of that responsibility that's given to them. And when we think about from a public policy point of view, one of the points of the goals of an issuer of a currency is to issue that currency. Imagine if you're in a football game or a basketball game and you say, oh, I can't play the day. We don't have enough points on the scoreboard. Or if the umpire gets on the field and starts to try and earn points. They start to try and kick a goal or something. You'd say, what are you doing? Your job isn't to try and earn points. Your job is to make sure the game works so that everybody else can earn points. At the end of the game, you should have given us more points than, than you have at the start. Otherwise, we haven't created a game. So if you're the issuer of the currency, you face a whole set of different questions than if you're a user of a currency. The user of the currency, like the player in a, in a sports game, wants to earn more of the currency. The issuer of the currency wants to give away the currency under the right circumstances. You know, usually in exchange for work or goods and services. So the last thing I want to just talk about is what this means in terms of political sovereignty. Because we can start to look at this question of who has the power to create money. And obviously, on one level, compared to all of us, the government's in a pretty unique position. But given that we're in Europe, it's also important to note that not every government is equal. Not every government has the same political, economic, or monetary capacity to engage in the kinds of activities that might be logically necessary for a currency issuer. So when we get to the question of who can create euros, that's a very important question about who is sovereign. That's not just a question about who's being responsible with their budget. It's a question of who did we give the authority to to make these decisions in the first place. So what I haven't talked about in this is private bond vigilantes. I haven't talked about how businesses are responsible for investing to ensure we have sufficient growth. We, I haven't talked about private credit relationships that much. All of those things are critically important, but are not at the core of understanding how monetary systems come into existence and how they work from the perspective of the issuer. So I'll end there and hopefully we can talk more in the comments, but uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you for the invitation. I find this extremely interesting. A, because rethinking economics is long overdue. So very, very nice that this conference has been organized. And secondly, well, the topic is very important. And uh, I was very impressed by the speaking from Rowan on money and the monetary system. And um, well, I have been given the title for my talk, which I have changed <laughs> since, uh, Money is Power. And well, that is true. And therefore, m money is power and very closely related to politics as well. And therefore, well, uh, my talk will be about the theoretical background for what money can do as a mean of a political instrument to improve the macroeconomic development. And this is, my talk is kept within modern monetary theory thinking. And uh, fortunately, this modern monetary theory is not that modern because, well, there is a very important root, roots for this thinking 
and one of the really outstanding routes which has already been quoted twice this morning is of course Maynard Keynes and his thinking about the working of the macroeconomic system. And shortly after Keynes, we had, well, Abba Lerner's contribution, which at that time in the 40s was called functional finance. But there are a number of similarities and good inspiration. One more of the previous or predecessors I would like to mention here is uh, a man I have learned a lot from, Wynne Godley, who was based in Cambridge and then later on at the Levy Institute. And well, he was one of the few, I can say, who predicted the financial crisis to come 10 years ago. He was outstanding in his approach, his Keynesian approach, his stock flow consistent modeling. So I can not too strongly recommend, and I have learned a lot from working with him. So here we are, but well, we have to be present, and the present arguments are titled uh, Modern Monetary Theory, and as it say, it focuses on money and on debt, and especially on the public sector financing, but not for the public sector on its own sake, but what can the public sector do with politics to improve the situation and development within the private sector. So the focus point here is on the private sector, in fact, and when we have understood what is going on and how employment, GDP is determined within the private sector, well, then we have the background to decide on politics, and here, well, money uh, comes in as a very important instrument so therefore, well, I want to move back uh, a little and look at the private sector mainly. And I should not forget my slides. And here we have um, starting point, private sector behavior and equilibrium. And that was also the starting point of Maynard Keynes. And uh, well, although when we have set the public sector, we should, but this is quite often forgotten, immediately also said, the, say, the private sector, because the public sector does not really mean, give any meaning uh, by itself. And this sector approach I like very much, but I will start to focus on the private sector and then go on from there. And that was also the starting point of Maynard Keynes and his macroeconomic theory, which was really counterposing to the general equilibrium theory, which was also ruling at that time. And in that perspective, there are many similar similarities between then and now. And Keynes's, well, empirical starting point why was back in the 30s, why are there persistent unemployment in the private sector? Why is the private sector not self-adjusting as we are taught from general equilibrium theorem theory at that time, the variation model. And he, his book is more or less entirely on the private sector not being self-adjusting and therefore needing a helping hand, which we also could call politics. And there were, well, the book is called employment, interest, and money. So here we are. But his focus point was on the private sector. Why, why can it, well, <laughs> adjust by itself? And the reason for that is lack of effective demand. That is really the innovative part, the real, really innovative part of this book to define and describe the importance of effective demand. If private firms do not expect that there is any demand for their goods, they will not produce as simple as that. And therefore, well, at his main explanation, 
there are many, but his main explanation to why there is this persistent lack of effective demand is uncertainty, which is not existing in general equilibrium economics. So uncertainty that the future is more or less unknown, and this is of course well known, but I think it cannot be emphasized too strongly that uncertainty keeps back real investment and make us save too much because we are uncertain about the future. That's very rational individual behavior. But when it adds up to the macro level, well, you easily find a situation, and the most common situation seems to be that there are too small real investment compared to the savings to create full employment. So here we are. And that is, well, what I call, and <laughs> Maynard Keynes could have called, structural unemployment. A persistent, persistent tendency. And this diagram is not very well functioning. I'm so sorry about that. It is not thought really through, but it is uh, uh, with inspiration from the only figure in the general theory. So, um, well, I excuse myself, but the point of this um, figure is that, well, if, and we know that the equilibrium or standstill position within the private sector is where the actual savings and real investment are equal. And if they equalize, and that's the point, the cross, if they equalize at an output which is smaller than full employment, the private sector gets stuck. It cannot help itself out. And then, well, and I think this is uh, also important, then we are in a situation that if we want to get full employment, max output, then we will see that the tendency within the private sector is to save much more. And, well, there might be a tendency, or at least there's a lack of real investment. So we have a gap at the potential full employment between what people want to save and what business want to invest. That is a structural ex private excess savings. And you know, savings which are not transferred into real investment is a, what you could call a barrier for firms and private business to produce because they cannot sell to the savings, financial savings does not directly create demand. So that is in some way the situation that most countries then and now lack effective demand because savings is not automatically transferred into real investment, which we are told by general equilibrium theory, but not A, by Keynes, B, by practice. So here we are, what to do. And here, of course, the public sector can play a crucial role because if there is this tendency to over saving or uh, excess savings within the private sector, and the situation is, well, very, very present. I can take my own country. We have forced uh, savings for pensions, which is accumulated in the pension funds, but the pension funds, A, they are not undertake real investment, and it is partly due to the law not allowed to create direct real investment. They are forced to buy secure assets, and what are secure assets? It's government bonds, and perhaps, uh, well, already existing uh, shares in firms which not necessarily transfer these, uh, these shares into new investment. So, and this is not a, a unique uh, situation. It's very similar in many other countries. So um, here we are. And uh, next is partly also relating to what um, we have just heard. Uh, when 
as soon as we say the public sector, we cannot analyze it independently of the private sector. And if you allow me just to look at this closed economic system, leaving the balance of payments a little aside, we can't take that up, but that would complicate the argument. Then, well, in this situation, if there is a, a surplus in the private sector, and that is realized, then it has to manifest itself as a deficit somewhere else. And therefore, to activate this tendency of access savings in the private sector, well, if you want to go for full employment, that is a political decision, but I cannot really recall or imagine any political party which at least explicitly say we go for high unemployment. So let's say that all political parties, so this argument is not related either to right or left, it is to understand how a modern economic system functions, that if you want to erase this excess private, or activate, I should better say, activate this excess private savings, an external force has to step in. And here, well, the obvious external force is, of course, government. Government can activate this excess uh, savings. And um, what is the way to access this is, of course, to buy real goods in the private sector, to make private firms sell more, produce more, because they can expect to sell more if the government step in, and then it is once again a political decision what kind of effective demand, what kind of real goods should the government activate. It could be anything from real public investment to, well, reduction in taxes or, so, or increased social benefit, would we, which would create more private consumption, and by that, more activity in the private sector. And that is a political debate which Keynes hardly stepped into. He said, well, there are many possibilities, but uh, uh, <laughs> the only thing I can say, Mr. Keynes, is that it is this excess savings in the private sector which really is the, the root problem. And then next step is how to activate it. And, um, well, I, I think this, well, and I hope that this, this explains, and if we say that we are in a specific situation, well then, the choice is either more public expenditures or less taxes. And then, of course, Harun, uh, then of course, well, the question which I always is met about is where should the money and where should the savings come from? And here, within this very simple framework, the savings is already there, or at least the tendency of the savings. And if you recalculate, well, how much uh, extra savings will increased government expenditure create via the simple multiplier effect taught at every first year course in macroeconomics, you will see that the coming equilibrium in the private sector has generated savings which exactly match the deficit in the public sector. Because an excess savings here has to be, has to be, it's bookkeeping. And non, not a single economist can object to that, has to be matched by a similar deficit. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, what about money? Yeah, well, as we have just heard, well, the government has the prerogative of being able to, well, at least if they are allowed during uh, 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 in, in the law uh, to print money. And here the modern monetary theory quite often consider the public sector as an integration of government and 
the central bank does not separate between these two things, which of course in practice, due to the legislation, uh, is not as simple as that. But here we are, well, savings is generated automatically. The problem is that there is too much saving, and how to finance it? Well, as long as there is a deficit of real investment in the private sector, too small real investments, and that was really the problem Keynes struggled with. What to do with this too small real investment? Then the obvious thing is, well, to get the rate of interest lower. And one way to get the rate of rate interest lower is to expand the money supply. That's exactly what we see in Europe these days. Quantitative easing is to expand the monetary supply to get the rate of interest lower. So as long as there's unemployment, well, to expand the monetary supply should not be, at least not an immediate problem then if we come closer to full employment and, um, and um, a tendency to inflation, the things change, but that's not the situation in most European uh, countries for the time being. So here we are, and now I will direct the, my attention to the present European situation uh, specifically. And, uh, well, this is just the... Um, equations I have described in, uh, in oral form. So, well, the implications of the EU treaty. But let me initiate this, well, short characteristics of the restrictions which the EU treaty and the Eurozone cooperation put on the national governments is, well, to ask the question, if you accept the analysis that there is a persistent structural unemployment in the private sector, but it varies between country to country. Is it that this related excess private structural savings, which vary from country to country, does it make sense, A, to put an absolute number to the, so the similar, the related deficits in the government budget. A, a number, and at least shouldn't it be different numbers from country to country depending on the structural unemployment. And the other uh, question, overall question, which is related to the EU treaty, does it make sense to have an independent central bank which is directed by economists, and I hardly dare to say by neoclassical economists, which in some way has a very skeptical view at politics and especially on active politics. If we accept that, well, an external force should govern the best as they can to improve the situation in the private sector, does it, then, does it then make sense to separate between the central bank and the government? That's one thing. And the other thing, does it make sense to have a pre-requirement, which is also in the treaty, that government may not finance its budget by print, so-called printed money, in any case, they have to sell bonds before they can spend a deficit, which means that before they have run a deficit, they have already pushed up the rate of interest by selling government bonds and making the rate of interest higher than it otherwise would have been, taking into consideration that the problem is that real investment, private real investment is too small. Where is the logic? Probably many of you share my doubts about this logic, but move one step out of this room and <laughs> you will meet that logic as the only common sense and the only right thing 
to think. Because they only look at one sector at a time, they look at the public sector at a time, and they make a similarity to a household. You cannot run a deficit for eternity. And well, we are not talking about running a deficit for eternity, not as soon as the private sector has improved on its own terms, well, there, there's no need for a deficit. But until then, there is a need and a good reason for a deficit financed either by printed money, if that's the problem, or later on bonds if the real private investment has gone up. So here we are. And having said that, well, well I hardly had to go through the uh, implications of the EU treaty. And here, what we should separate, but not basically. The, there's basically no difference between the EU treaty, which counts for all member countries, and then the Eurozone um, uh, regulation, which of course only counts for the uh, Eurozone countries, but it basically is just a more strict regulation system imposed on these Euro countries because they have given up their own monetary sovereignty. But really, what the dif there is this major difference that giving up the monetary sovereignty, which we also heard uh, from Rowan, uh, well, really means that, well, then, and to, when a country gives up its monetary sovereignty, it means that all money becomes foreign money. You lose the power to regulate your own monetary supply. All money becomes. And it means that uh, to have a government deficit is similar to a country like Sweden or Norway running a balance of payments deficit where you have to borrow abroad, or even Denmark. So uh, uh, this regulation is imposed on all EU countries, and it is a regulation on the actual public sector budget where they don't separate between, well, what is caused by uh, an uh, active fiscal policy and what is caused by automatic, automatic stabilizers. And as we saw in the years 2009, 2010, and further on, 11, that all countries, even Germany, broke this rule. Because it's, it's yeah, excuse me, it's nonsense. No one can explain where this 3% comes from. It was just there, and then it suddenly became a, a common <laughs> rule, uh, and, and, and written really in, in granite. And on top of that, well, when uh, the EU Commission and other extinguished economists thought that, well, the expansionary fiscal policy in the years 2009-2010 was, well, of course, enlarging the deficits. And why should it enlarge the deficit? Because the excess savings in the private sector has increased immensely. Then they put a further br uh, break on uh, government activities by the so-called fiscal compact, where they, and then they introduced this concept of structural deficit, which is a measurement of active fiscal policy, and that is limited to half a percentage in any case, also in deep recessions. Active fiscal policy is not allowed to exceed half a percentage of GDP at any time if you sign up to the fiscal com compact. Of course, the British said, oh, well, my government know better. So they didn't sign up. But uh, except for Britain and the Czech Republic, all other countries signed up because they were advised this is common sense. Of course, you should balance at least your structured budget in any case and forgetting that it means no fiscal policy worth mentioning even in deep recessions if you accept the rule. And now it's, for example, written into the Danish, not constitutions, and thank you for that, but into Danish law. And with a vast majority in Parliament, because this is common sense, it cannot be otherwise. That would be unsound poli politics. So here we are, and um, no consideration 
in, in these rules, independent government, uh, central bank from government, um, I have already mentioned that. And the problem from this point of view is, of course, no consideration of unemployment. These rules count whatever the unemployment situation, my God. And this counts independent of the balance of payment situation. And what really is a problem for the working of the monetary union is the balance of payments imbalances. The German surplus is the pure mercantilism and is suppressing the other members because, as you know, when balance of payments add up, it has to add up to zero, especially in the long period where there was equilibrium, external equilibrium. So a German surplus on the balance of payments had to manifest itself as a deficit in other countries, creating a lot of problem. So here we are, and uh, well, I hardly have to say anything more that, well, at least according to monetary, modern monetary theory, well, uh, these restrictions uh, gen generated uh, via the EU treaty and the uh, monetary union is not related in Keynes's thinking or in realistic economics. It's out of some artificial model. So therefore, what Torvald, well, you said, the problem is really to use relevant models. Models we cannot work without, but they have to be relevant. And then, well, what would um, uh, MMT recommend in this situation? Well, I will not go into details. Uh, if, if you have an interest, well, you can read here the, the euro, why it failed. And it has failed because it has created unemployment to an unseen level through 10 years, and it will continue. Maybe the euro will survive, but the political cost is immensely. And of course, what many of the Keynesian or post-Keynesian economists um, well, suggest is to go back, to, in, in fact, to Keynes' uh, recommendations, which was partly implemented in the Bread and Wood Agreement, but to have fixed but adjustable exchange rates, no restriction on the government budget, but restrictions on the balance of payments, especially for countries with a surplus. That countries with a surplus should be forced either to reduce the surplus or to pay into the, to the uh, not the European Clearing Bank, that it would be here, but to the a kind of world clearing bank, the excess, because that is a pressure on the deficit countries, and if they cannot find out to recirculate it themselves, we will help them. And Keynes <laughs> would help, in this case, with the Americans to recycle at that time, but then they fortunately invented the Marshall Aid, which was a kind of recycling the balance of payments deficit. So what we we, I say, well, uh, I would uh, recommend is an updated and modernized bread and wood system where one of the, well, I think, important uh, points is, well, is it a good idea to have free international financial capital flows where speculation all the time goes up against the weakest countries, these countries which have difficulties more than enough and have difficulties to defend their more or less fixed exchange rates. Why don't we think more about diverting and divide capital flows between serious capital flows related to traded goods, services, and direct investment, and then to prohibit uh, or forbid the uh, speculative what, what is the use of this speculative? I can see the banking system. I can see Goldman Sachs <laughs> benefiting. But does the national economies benefit from free capital financial flows, especially the speculative ones? Keynes was very skeptical, and he was able to secure that there was severe restrictions on financial capital flows not directly related to real 
transaction activities from the year 45 and until, well, let's say the middle of the 70s. At that time, Keynes was dead, and um, yeah, that's another story. <laughs> and this was my story. Thank you. Uh, hello, thanks for the invitation. I'm not part of this network, I'm uh, just, uh, just a teacher and a textbook writer. Um, but at least I was a 1968er. I was a student in 1968. That's uh, the more... Uh, uh, and I had, a, I had a neoclassical upbringing in Bergen, but I also had a very good Keynesian upbringing. And those two things were not uh, consistent, but we didn't mind. Uh, and I have always been a Keynesian. Uh, because at that time, uh, back in the 60s, still the, the Great Depression was a reality that everybody was concerned about. Uh, so, so, uh, so therefore, and, and as far as I could see, and still uh, I have the same opinion, it's no, no way that classical economic theory can explain the Great uh, um, Depression. But Keynes could explain it. And this is uh, the best explanation uh, that I at least uh, have seen. And I think uh, uh, many economists, even if they ha also had a neoclassical upbringing, also are Keynesians when it comes to explaining that really bad things can happen. And then you need Keynes to understand it has to do with lack of uh, aggregate demand or, or uh, effective demand, as Keynes said. Um, <clears throat> let's start with, uh, uh, with rethinking economics and finance. So uh, I think it's very important, both for young and uh, old <laughs> students and scholars, and I see <coughs> I was afraid I was the oldest person here and the only young people, but also more mature people are in the, uh, in the audience. And there are exciting new academic research forthcoming all over the world, and that's a positive effect of the Great Recession. So phenomena like credit cycles, asset price bubbles, financial instability and market co coordination failures are now very important for academic researchers as well as policy makers. And I and, and uh, I think many economists look at the, the Great uh, Depression as a market coordination failure. The market failed to coordinate and keep full employment and always full employment. So you need uh, different theories. You cannot rely on Wolverishian theories if you want to explain uh, the Great Depression and also the Great Recession uh, after 2007. But before 2007, some influential conservative US economists took the untested hypothesis of rational microeconomic behavior, rational expectations and perfect markets to the extreme, supporting uh, market fundamentalism as an uh, ideology. And that was very unfortunate because almost all the economists that I know are not really market fundamentalists. So, so but, but the, uh, in, in politics, they pop up and want uh, uh, policies that are really uh, hurting uh, the economy and uh, creating uh, huge uh, income differences. Uh, <clears throat> so this, uh, uh, so this new research, I think that has changed economics uh, to a great extent. I was myself uh, editor of Scandinavian Journal of Economics back in year 2000, and I can assure you, what's now coming to the to the journals are very different from what we got then. Then. We had a problem with uh, too many theoretical articles, too few empirical articles, and we did all we could, uh, my colleague and, uh, from Sweden and I, to, to try to, to get more empirical uh, uh, papers. So now empirical testing and experiments 
of economic behavior are important in academic research. Uh, and we know that the human brain makes systematic mistakes, not random mistakes. So it makes it much easier to explain herd behavior, asset bubbles and finan financial crisis. And financial instability and regulation are now important topics in macroeconomics or finance. And of course, in Norway and, and in, let's say in Scandinavia, due to the banking crisis, uh, uh, the understanding that you need to have better financial regulation was, uh, uh, was important. Like we have here a former uh, 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 director of the financial uh, uh, authority. Financial regulation authority in Norway, or Kreditilsyn as it had then, now the Finanstilsyn. Uh, <clears throat> we also know now that fishing for fools, profit seeking, does not increase national income. It just some smart people take money away from, from less smart people, and a lot of, uh, of capitalism is about that, particularly in the financial sector. But that doesn't create values for the total society. And institutions matter. When I uh, uh, studied economics, institution was not mentioned. But I had a course in sociology, and there it was very important. Uh, uh, but uh, now we know that wastely different political and economic institutions explain the huge observed differences in living standards around the world. And that is so institutions have become extremely important for. Uh, for economic policy, and you have to take into account the, the uh, uh, political institutions and the uh, politics uh, in, before you can talk or try to give advice on economic policy. And that was a grave mistake of the neoclassicals because they thought that you could just study the economic system and then you could give uh, advice to politicians about what to do. And of course, they didn't listen. <clears throat> when it comes to money, everybody thinks money is important except classical economists. <laughs> but money is important. It's a very fascinating and mysterious topic. Mm. But classical, including neoclassical economic theory, have very little to say about it. The quantitative theory of money, the idea is that money is neutral, financial markets are efficient, and the modigliano miller theorem is true. It is, uh, that that is true represents the classical view on money and credit basically, and to make it simple. So ironically, outside economics, money is considered extremely important for our behavior, social relations, and even civilization. And of course, wise men and also comedians have a lot to say about money, like money is the root of all evil, the lack of money is the root of all evil, uh, money can't buy friends, but it can get you a better class of enemy. And here you are, Jefferson, never spend your money before you have it. So is Jefferson the source of the apparent money and fiscal illusions in the US co Congress that the MMT addresses? Never spend before you have the tax revenues. Many people think that is uh, important. And then they don't understand economics. <laughs> and even in the Norwegian parliament, uh, now not even, in, in all parliaments, there are a lot of fiscal illusions and, and money illusions. And uh, when I was a, a PhD student, an old economist told me about uh, the storting, the parliament discussion in the 50s, because each year the politicians had to discuss the balance sheet of the central bank. And in this central bank balance sheet, it was very interesting, because in the 40s, the Germans had printed a lot of money, so the goal, to, to take the goal away and send it to England was not really important, but of course everybody thought that. Uh, but economists like Knut Yixell and others said that, oh, you could even have brick stones, bricks in the, in the uh, Norwegian Bank, you didn't need gold. And of course the uh, Germans then produced a lot of, of, uh, of money, created uh, and used it to spend, and then on the balance sheet in the Bank of Norway, there was on the passive side, there was a big item uh, called the occupation account. That was, in a sense, the trace from the Germans, the German occupation. And each year, the parliament did a, had a long 
discussion about this item. How to get rid of it? As if that would, <laughs> would uh, you know, change the, the history. So he, this economist was really frustrated uh, about this, uh, why they spent so much time on this uh, silly question, or well, not, not, not a real question, and not discussed uh, important things. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Classical, I mean, I'm, not, I'm now talking about more modern things, because uh, Rohan said that by modern, he really thought about the 4,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thought that MMT was about much more recent things, but I'll come back to that. But, uh, so I talk about more recent things. And uh, Pigou, uh, a classical economist, uh, said that the institutional money is a powerful instrument promoting wealth and effort, but the number of units of money embodied in the instrument is, of, in general, of no significance. So this is really the money's neutral view of money doesn't really matter. Uh, so the classicals didn't really, they, they just assumed that money was there, but then they forgot about it and analyzed the real economy uh, as money was not important. And that, and, uh, Keynes criticized Bigou for analyzing business cycle slumps without taking into account the interactions between money processes and the real economy. So Keynes rejected the quantity theory, and earlier Knut Excel had done the same. But unfortunately, Milton Friedman reformulated in 1956 the quantity theory, taking into account Keynes' liquidity preference. And this modern, so-called modern quantity theory and monetarism had a considerable influence on macroeconomics, but central banks found out that it was impossible in practice to control the money supply. And that was important for the monetarists. So, okay, it was a beautiful theory, but it was not uh, a good theory in practice. <coughs> now we have inflation targeting, and that's not so just about uh, uh, controlling inflation, but also about uh, uh, limiting business cycles. And for the first time in history, I hope I'm right here, uh, I have to talk to historians, but uh, central banks have found a way to keep the rate of inflation persistently low with fiat money. So even if money is worthless, just paper or, or just uh, electronic accounts, it, it has been possible to control inflation. But of course in the older histories, all the kings and so on, they, they inflated because they couldn't control their expenditures but therefore we have more independent banks, central banks, so it's not so easy for, uh, for governments to, to create inflation. If, if, you, if I ask this audience before 1989, do you believe that, you could, uh, that the central banks could influence business cycles and the rate of inflation by controlling the rate of interest on banks' overnight deposits and lending in the, in the bank? Everybody said, of course not. I mean, that's ridiculous. How can this, this silly little interest rate have any effect at all on the real economy? Yes, it has. And the explanation is uh, expectations. The central banks are able to manipulate expectations. So therefore, this short-run interest rate influences longer-term interest rates in the whole entire economy. Uh, through the yield curve and, and the expectations that it creates. So when the central bank say cut the interest rate, the, the, what we call the seeding rate, the, the, yeah, the rate um, uh, then they change expectations all over the country economy. And you can see it, if this policy is not expected already, you can see it at once in the market, in, in a, a couple of seconds. They change uh, exchange rates, they change the, the money market rates at least up to one year, and, and often longer. <coughs> and I, so this was so uh, unexpected that no one would believe it. So therefore, practice came before theory. It worked. Everybody was extremely surprised. And then they started with uh, trying to make, have theories explaining it. 
And there here, Michael Woodford, Princeton, and Svensson in Stockholm are two very central economists that developed the theory of inflation targeting using central banks as their laboratories in the 1990s. So they got the data from the real central banks trying to, to, uh, to run inflation targeting. They made their theories. Of course, then they, <laughs> this was of course consistent with the data, so it was good theories. And this they call their approach Vixellian. Also, Ben Bernanke uh, was one of the economists that did some important work on inflation targeting, and he wanted inflation targeting in, in, uh, in the US. And I met a Norwegian economist back in 1990 saying, no, we don't like inflation targeting. We want it's much better to have the US policy, monetary policy. That's better than inflation targeting. And then I said, well, Bernanke wants the Norwegian system. Because he wants, wanted inflation targeting that we have, and Sweden and other countries. So in the end, then, Vixell and Keynes, who was not accepting, rejecting the quantitative theory, they won the academic battle. And Q, uh, quantitative theory lost. And uh, Woodford have shown, in theory, inflation targeting will even work without currency. So we can have the so-called pengelöse the money as a currency, money, uh, the society of economy without currency, and this will still work because it has to do with expectations coming from the central bank's change in the, in the, uh, the, the rate. <clears throat> well, I thought that modern economic theory was modern, something after 2003, so I was a bit surprised when Rohan said that uh, it's not that. And I accept that. accept that. And then also Rohan said that uh, uh, mon uh, unemployment is a monetary phenomenon. Well, 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 I'm not sure that how, uh, how what does it really say? Because we had money for the last 4,000 years, at least, more than money. But unemployment is a very recent phenomenon. Do I spend too much time? No, it's OK. It's okay? We need some time for discussion. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I, I can, uh, I can uh, skip some slides. So why didn't you got, get m unemployment earlier? So unemployment must be something more than just monetary phenomenon. And also, what does it really mean that something is monetary phenomenon? So it's, you need, really need better research going deep, digging deeper uh, to talk about unemployment. But I agree that Keynes, uh, in, uh, the, the cyclical unemployment and the depressions and so on, that's clearly very important to understand in terms of money, but not only money, also credit, credit and bank and bank failures. So the Great Depression had a lot to do with the massive bank failures in the United States, as uh, the uh, research of Bernanke has shown. Okay, so I, I, I went to uh, the, the, the website and I found a lot of, of uh, quotes that indicates that we rediscovered old ideas. Taxes exist in order to control inflation, I agree. Uh, and it uh, seems to me that uh, what stimulated this, uh, this MMT so-called theory is uh, more that it was important to get a better discussion in the, in the US Congress, because there there was a lot of, of fiscal and money illusions. Uh, and uh, it's not really a new theory of economics. I'm sure that you, you agree, but uh, uh, that's not important for me uh, today. <clears throat> and what basic monetary economics that does not seem to be challenged by MMT is like money is fungible. I think that's very important to, to express, and a lot of people and politicians don't really think in that way. And it can be, uh, so we cannot really mark money. It's just like energy. You cannot see that this energy comes from the, that waterfall, and that energy comes from this waterfall. That's impossible. And if you have a common uh, bank account with your wife, you can see that that part of the bank account is my money, and that is your money. It's possible. It's fungible. And that's given by law, a social construct, not by nature. And central banks are monopoly issuers. So I guess this is what the MMT also agree. 
on. So we have monetary base, we have a monopoly, we have a stock of money. So uh, the monetary base can be controlled by the central bank, but not the, uh, the money stock, because that's a lot of uh, mostly bank deposits. Uh, so this is probably not controversial at all. And also in the, what's special for the US, that is a lot of demand for dollars from central banks uh, outside U US, so demand for dollars are, is extreme. And also, uh, it gives real income. It gives some real income to the US government that they have the reserve value, the, uh, the reserve currency in the world. And that explains, of course, that the U US would never start a huge inflation. Because then they lose this, uh, yeah, two minutes. Okay. So let, let's uh, just go forward. And uh, here also, I, I agree uh, with uh, this uh, website that uh, uh, government can pay, uh, can uh, uh, run deficits without, uh, so the taxation can be lower than, uh, uh, than to equalize the budget. And uh, it's possible, at least partially, for government spending without corresponding taxes. So this is possible in the modern, modern uh, economies. Then they say that the, fiat, the website said that fiat currency is a social construct, I agree. And there are therefore no fiscal limits to how much a sovereign currency nation can spend. And there I disagree, but it depends on the definition of spending. Is it in dollar? which is going to be inflated, or is it in real goods and services? And in the latter case, uh, there are clearly fiscal limits. Um, and here also I show that tax cuts without government spending are possible without increased inflation, in, in the inflation targeting. And the short story is that the, the, the central bank undo the effects of the fiscal policy. So interest rate goes up, the real exchange rate appreciates, so that the corona gets very strong and the, the lose competitiveness, and then it's possible to, to finance, in a sense, uh, these uh, tax cuts without inflation. But there are effects on future generations. So if uh, the interest rate is larger than G, the the growth rate of the real GDP, then future generations will lose from tax cuts now. So in a sense, uh, present politicians then take away income from future generations. So that's a serious issue that is a very important, at least here in, in, in Norway. And also then it can be shown that uh, also these tax cuts policy uh, leads to lower national wealth. Comments on Jespersen, uh, so uh, some famous economists like uh, Stiglitz and Krugman. Stiglitz has a big book about uh, the European uh, Monetary Union. They are very critical to, to this union. And I think it's wise for Denmark to stay outside and have a fixed exchange rate, because then if things really turns bad, you could devaluate, right? So uh, I think that's wise to keep outside the union. And for Norway, it's much more important because of oil revenues, meaning that we can get business cycle situations that are very different from the EU, and then we get the wrong monetary policy from the EU back to us. So it's important for Norway to stay out. Uh, but, so I agree with Stiglitz, Krugman, and Jesperson in this respect. However, a monetary union cannot survive without some common rules of fiscal policy. So the question is, what kind of rules must there be? This is the last. Fundamentally, inflation has fiscal roots. So the European Central Bank cannot alone, alone prevent inflation without fiscal responsibility. And history has shown that some countries, I will not mention uh, the names of those countries, uh, are not fiscally responsible, and they could behave as free riders in the EU, EMU, EMU and, and in the long run, destroy it. So I'm not sure, but I'm not sure that yes, person disagrees. You can uh, <laughs> tell. Okay, thanks. I'll give each of you an opportunity to comment very briefly on the others. So uh, before we take questions, 
Um, if you have any reflections or comments on what the other speaker was saying. So could we start with you and then Jesper and Erling? Sure, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, just to go through some of the points, and thank you for such a thoughtful engagement. I really appreciate that. And, you know, it's so nice after so many years where people weren't engaging with these ideas to finally have people engaging with it in such a constructive way. Um, just really quickly, and hopefully we can keep talking about this at lunch and after. Um, first of all, MMT has a political popular program, but it's also a quite deep body of academic literature. So the history and things and the things that it talks about beyond just the last 15 years is in a lot of the literature. It doesn't come out in the way that we talk in the blogs and in public interviews and things, because that's not the most important way to frame it to the public. But it is a seriously coherent and, and integrated body of theory, theory and history. So I, I would say that when it comes to things like monetary inflation targeting and things, there are people like Scott Fulweiler and others that have looked a lot at that and, and I'd love to talk with you more about their technical arguments. We don't need to get into that now. Um, in terms of the unemployment as a monetary phenomenon question, I think it does come really to a fundamental question of who's responsible for the injustice of, of unemployment. We can talk about the economics of unemployment, but the idea that there are people that are being actively kept in the state of unemployment by government policy, and we're seeing this right now around the world with interest rate rises, people talking about natural rates of unemployment that they're trying to get back to. We've created a policy regime where we're deliberately putting people into unemployment to balance inflation, and I think the responsibility for the social harms that comes from that has to be placed with the government. Um, this question of the fact that MMT isn't new, just a really quick example here. Joan Robinson once described the difference between uh, Keynes and Marshall, both responding to people in the, in the previous generation like Ricardo, that they took different questions. Um, they both were exploring this question of value, but where Keynes said, okay, what's the value as society? How are we making this question? Marshall said, what's the price of a cup of tea? And that question occupied most neoclassical economists for about 60 years. Pretty boring question, if you ask me, in terms of social impact, but it enabled people to get distracted from the really important questions. So I think about MMT is that even if it's old ideas, the packaging and the emphasis starts us from a different starting point, which gets us to a whole range of interesting new questions and conversations a lot faster without spending 60 years on the price of a cup of tea first. Um, in terms of the insights, I actually, there was a great article in Bloomberg a few years ago about how um, of the people who predicted the Eurozone publicly, about five out of eight on their list were MMTers. So I think, I, I hear your point, certainly the US's dominant narrative is a really important thing that MMT is pushing back against, but it has implications for the Eurozone, for developing countries. Um, I work on central bank digital currency regulation uh, and design, and it has huge implications for the way we think about the future of money in, in the 21st century. Um, so I, I think, again, um, the, the, the implications on a range of broad, broad policy areas are there in the literature, even if they're not coming out in the sort of headline articles that you may see in the press. Um, and, and lastly, just uh, the limits to spending uh, are real and not monetary. I think we're in furious agreement about that. And, and the real question that we're all here about is how to build that prosperity, so. Yeah, well, I'm in the fortunate position that I I think I agree with both speakers, <laughs> so I can leave it very brief and just pass on the microphone for you. I think in, in order to really disagree, we have to um, spend much more time discussing. <laughs> but of course, there are always disagreements. But I mean, uh, uh, I think uh, this uh, approach is welcome. Uh, uh, money is obviously very important, but uh, economists usually have not thought so. But uh, that's wrong. So, so uh, and not least in the more wider social setting. Uh, or yeah. So um, when it comes to unemployment, um, it, we haven't time to really discuss that and why we have unemployment and so on. So uh, well, we, we just we can take that another time. Uh, it's, it's too complicated to just <laughs> <laughs> say. Okay. Oh, well, may I say lack of uh, effective demand? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's. Uh, is this working? Yeah, uh, okay, we leave it at that, and uh, then we open up for questions. Uh, anybody have a question here for anybody in the panel? And pr please present yourself and use a mic. And there was one up in the back. We'll take you first. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Cecilia smith and I represent World Heritage Catalysis. Thank you very much, it's been very interesting. Uh, my question specifically goes to Professor Jespersen. 
And uh, the Belgian economist Bernard Lieter, he was one of the architects behind the um, euro, and he proposed the euro as a complementary currency. And um, this was uh, one of the arguments was to avoid cr uh, credit uh, shortage and they were for enable more efficient use of resources. <coughs> um, yeah. So, um, do you think that if uh, you, um, the euro had been introduced as a complementary currency rather than replacing uh, national currency, if the, the problems that you presented would have been avoided or the, the current situation would have looked different? Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you very much uh, to the three speakers for the presentation, it was really interesting. My name is uh, Louison Cain Fouro. I am a postdoc researcher in ecological macroeconomics at the Vienna uh, University of Economics and uh, Business. I had a question for uh, Professor Grungmo, but perhaps the three speakers can, uh, can comment on, uh, regarding inflation targeting by central bank. Because if we agree that we live in a world of endogenous money, meaning that money is created as credit when commercial banks uh, are, are addressed a credit worthy uh, demand for it. So the central bank has no control whatsoever on the quantity of money in circulation. Then the consequence of it is that uh, inflation cannot be a monetary phenomenon uh, outside the situation where the economy is at full employment. But at full employment in a world of endogenous money, it makes no sense to have net money creation. So uh, my question is, uh, does it still make sense to have inflation targeting as an objective of monetary policy? And uh, my second question would be, because I think endogenous money now is well understood by central bankers, so uh, th what they do in fact is inflation rate targeting, and uh, do they continue to say they do inflation targeting just for political reason, or do they really <coughs> believe in it? Yeah, one last question from the front here. Hi, uh, my name is Maria and I'm a student of economics at the University of Oslo. I'd like to thank all of you for very interesting um, talks. And my question is mostly directed to Aling, but I mean, you can feel free to comment if you wish. What you talked about in the beginning, you said that the field of economics has changed a lot since the financial crisis. Well, I understand that you talked about papers and research, but as a student, I'm quite concerned with the fact that the education hasn't changed much. It has changed somewhere, but marginally uh, at most. So to take a simple example, you said also later that the quantitative theory of money has lost the battle. So then my question is, in your textbooks in economics, do you also state this? And, and how, do you <laughs> how do you deal with the theory? And how much has it really changed? OK, then we have three questions, and uh, you can respond, each of you. Uh, you know, Erling got one, you got one. One quick comment. That's OK. okay. So yeah. inflation targeting. Yeah, you can um, go for it. So it is possible to control inflation, uh, even if you don't control the money supply. And, and that is uh, not only theory. I mean, it's, it's practice. For the last 20 years, 25 years, this has happened. I think that's a, a progress for economic science because before 1989, nobody talked about inflation targeting. So uh, uh, it works. Uh, but of course, uh, there are situations where central banks uh, uh, will uh, face a dilemma because uh, there can be so called uh, co uh, cost shocks that increase inflation even if there are no change in the business cycle. And in order to make the inflation target credible, the central bank has to do something. It cannot just forget about it. Because then inflation expectations can start to change. So because uh, the central bank wants to, to have uh, expectations of inflation in the society equal to the target, which is now 2% in Norway, it was 2.5% uh, last year. Uh, Th they must act to these cost shocks, even if it hurts in terms of in the business cycle, because it may lead to to lower uh, aggregate demand and uh, and uh, GDP than uh, the normal or potential GDP. So, so that of course, but nobody has has uh, found a way out of this dilemma yet. Maybe 
one will discover. But what, what is not working is price and uh, infl uh, wage and price controls. Because if, if that really worked well, then you could do that, of course. You could, you could regulate price and wage setting. But there are so many other disadvantages with that. So no politician or nobody really will g argue that we should go that way. Mm. President Nixon was a, was a, did, did this. And one problem was, for example, that suppose you regulate the price of one chocolate bar. But how can you avoid that the company, chocolate company, just makes the bar a little bit smaller? Then you have to regulate that too. So you had a vast bureaucracy trying to regulate quantities and prices. And then <laughs> that was very costly. And, and uh, so, so nobody wants, uh, as far as I know, uh, go this way. In, in co as to textbooks, I, I, uh, in, my f in the first edition of my textbook from 2004, I took uh, some uh, uh, quantity theory material, mostly for historical reasons. But uh, in the, uh, now I'm, uh, a new ed edition is coming, and this is just taken away because there are so many misunderstandings about. Some people think that, okay, you can just change the money supply, and then you can change the rate of inflation. But that's not true at all, because there are uh, yeah, money is endogenous and so on. There's a lot of so. I mean, uh, the quantity theory creates more misunderstandings uh, than. So it's better not to, to well, his, uh, people in economic history can talk about it, but I mean, it's, they lost really the academic battle. Uh, the monetarism lost. I think that's uh, uh, what we can say now. Okay, but DSGE lives. <laughs> no, no, DSGE sorry. Lives. DSGE models lives on. We can take that yeah, discussion afterwards. <laughs> um, and then Jesper, about alternative or complementary currencies or any um, other? Yeah, and then um, we land. okay, let me take uh, this about the complementary currency. Uh, but I would like to start uh, in another position. Why was the euro introduced? Was it honestly due to proper, genuine, solid economic arguments, or was it due to a political agenda of European integration, and then it was thought that this was a step forward. We know well behind closed doors that this will, will not work. But due to the neo-functionalist thinking, well, then a new crisis will emerge, and then we could take one more step and integrate the uh, finance policy, for example, or we could make forced uh, labor market um, uh, reforms as we have seen, forced labor market reforms in a number of countries to make the European countries more similar from a liberal point of view and from an integrative point of view. I'm very much in doubt. Well, I'm not in doubt. <laughs> and then you could say, what about a parallel, and in fact, what a complementary um, currency could also, and was called at that time also a parallel currency that uh, why not circulate a common currency uh, parallel with national currencies that would not remove exchange rate uncertainties, but at least abroad we could use one common currency. And also for some of the internal functioning, especially of the common agricultural policy, well, we had already the EQ, which was an awaited average of the national currencies. So um, uh, that could have been implemented that could have worked and maybe have been a first very, very tiny stepping stones to a monetary union at a later stage if economies were ready for that later on. But um, really, this is a political agenda which now, on one might say, unfortunately has failed because more and more countries are now becoming skeptical because, well, the good was not delivered. Prosperity was not delivered, quite the opposite. So there are reasons to be skeptical, especially to the economists and the politicians. Perhaps they didn't know better how <laughs> they had another agenda. But to the economists, I think, really, well, all of us, 
all of us have here an obligation. Sorry to be to 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 take this moral standpoint point, but I could continue with your question. Textbooks, they have not changed. Not changed very much. Maybe they have taken a little bit more empirical uh, stuff, but look at Gregory Mankiw. And I have checked it from the very first edition which came out in the early 90s until the this, uh, I think, uh, 11th edition which came out in 2016. Very, very little has changed and you are still taught the vertical Phillips curve determined by the exogenous money supply, full stop. And you, if you fail on that, you fail your exam. <laughs> and there was a man who walked out in, uh, in Howard University, but uh, man he, he, he wasn't disturbed by that because I'm the examiner. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry uh, for this discretion. Um, uh, well, we have to talk about monetary targeting. And if you say that it has delivered, well, we, uh, no, uh, sorry, sorry, yes, 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 sorry, inflate. We, we need a, an extended lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I think we uh, should give, uh, uh, you wanted to add? Yeah, okay, just a little, little bit. Um, <laughs> so, look, I just wanted to say, in terms of the, the I just wanted this quote regards to the European Union, which was Abiel, who was an advisor to Mitterrand in the early 80s. He said, we imagine the 3% deficit figure in less than an hour. It was a back of the envelope calculation without any theoretical reflection. Mitterrand wanted us to provide him with an easy rule, which sounded economic, with which he could confront the ministers who marched into his office asking for more money. We needed something simple. 3%, it was a good figure, a figure that stood the test of time. It was reminiscent of the Trinity. Mitterrand wanted a standard and we gave it to him. So I would just say that the, the economics that we get is a reflection of the politics that we demand. If we want new economics, we have to demand it and it will come into being. Okay.